Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions than answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link davidtemplebooks.com slash books okay there you'll see the poser just click and you're on your way again the link is davidtemplebooks.com slash books otherwise just head over to amazon okay thanks for your support and now on with the show Welcome to another episode of The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. I am pretty stoked because today we have a return guest, one of our favorites. And when I say our, I mean me. (laughs) Mr. Ted Bell. Listen as we discuss his latest Alex Hawk thriller, Seahawk. We'll also discuss a myriad of ideas, including some of a more personal nature. Oh, and an added bonus, you'll meet his Countess Victoria as she sets up the show. All right, folks, it's time to get in The Thriller Zone. Hi, hi, I'm not Ted. <laughs> you're Victoria. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, okay, here you go. Here is Ted. David. Well, hello, handsome fella. Are you good looking? Aren't we supposed to be in Miami sitting on Cap Key having a couple of margaritas and like watching the birds go by? We are supposed to. And uh, by the way, thank you, Victoria, for teeing us up. Oh, you're welcome. Is it working like this? <laughs> it's working beautifully. Okay, good. Yeah, apologies, but we we had a big old switcheroo on family things, and it actually worked out good because three weeks ago I got the flu, and I'm just now over it. Yikes, yikes, yikes. Well, it's done wonders for your voice. You sound like a real announcer. Why, thank (laughs) you, Theodore. (laughs) I'm trying to sound like one, but it doesn't really work for me. Hey. I like the uh, I like the setup. This is different than the last time. Well, we're down in Charleston now. Mm, Charleston. Oh, from South Carolina. Mm, lovely. Lovely. <laughs> what y'all doing down there? Well, we're going to parties and dinner parties and cocktail parties and drinking mint juleps and watching polo matches and holy hell on the Ashley River <laughs> and looking for the house where. Where, uh, what was the woman's name in Gone with the Wind that lived in, in uh, Charleston? They were all Miss Pity Pat. Remember her? She yes, was, yes, you know, yes. We were trying to figure out where her house is. Oh, goodness gracious. All right, now, all right, I'm going to give you the other one. Okay. Um, if, if Victoria says she's standing by, if you need her, just give a shout. She'll be running in here for whatever reason. Beautiful. All right. All right. Well, it's so nice to have our old friend Ted Bell back on the Thriller Zone. Great to be back on the Thriller Zone. Peter. Yeah, can you? Believe, last time we chatted was August. No, and and that was when we were playing on the Miami trip, right? Yeah, I know. Listen, pr- please don't think that I'm a, a no, dreamer. No, no, or, I'm not trying to rub this in. I'm oh. trying to, to re re tee it up, like we do it later in Jan in December or early in Jan. We still do it. I would like that. We're going to take about half of December off and go visit family, the other side of the family. Yeah, good for you. But yeah, January, February, right when... Um, oh, wait a minute. Yes, let's let's talk about that off camera because uh, oh. I've got some ideas. But great, great, great. great. We, we were talking Dragonfire last time. And that uh, Ted, we were two months into the show. We had just started, so... Uh, a couple things I want to say. Sure. First of all, thank you for taking a chance on me in this show because it's because of authors like you that help the stature of the show and help it to grow. So well, that's very kind of you. It's my pleasure, actually. 
And it has gone down in my own personal history is one of my favorites. It was very well received, lots of downloads. Oh, that's great. That's great, David. And I hope you have just millions of books of uh, Dragonfire sold. Thousands, How has that thousands, been going? Thousands of them, you know. <laughs> Veritable millions. <laughs> oh, my Lord. We did have, um, we had like, uh, just on the website alone, I think we had something around 15, 1,500 downloads, and that doesn't include Apple or Stitcher or Spotify, so... <laughs> Yeah, we know, so so when you say a download, they're downloading what the entire podcast? Yeah, they're in downloading your show. Oh, okay. Um, mm-hmm. Is that a Coca Cola or is that something else uh, more flavorful? They, um, this is known as the Cuba Libre. If we were in Havana, which is Coke and rum, however, it has neither Coke nor rum. It has Diet Coke <laughs> and. Uh, and I and I don't know what you call that. That's called a diet coke on ice. Diet coke on ice. <laughs> Not nearly as interesting as what we were having. I think we we teed up a couple of martinis last time. I had a martini on the standby that I uh, brandished at the end of the show, and then you ran off while uh, Miss Hightower. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, did a uh, horn blower. Horn blower. Yeah. Sorry. And so I went in the kitchen and made one and brought it out on the set. <laughs> and you couldn't get back to the camera fast enough to go. <laughs> no, I was to disappear before I could get there with the glass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so nice to see you with. Ca- you. you call her Countess Victoria, don't you? I do. Yeah. It's so beautiful. There's a lot like, of veracity in that, actually. It's, it's a story for another time, but it's. It is what it is. I do have a, I'm going to start off with this question. I'm going to, it's buried a little bit later in the show when we get to rapid fire questions. But on a personal note, when you two vacation together, yeah. does she have to keep your nose out of your next creation? Or are you smart enough to let her be the sole reason for your vacation? I'm not sure. So um, you mean, does she have to drag me away from working to have yes. to lie on the beach? Yes. No. Good. No, I need to be so bad right now. I'm ready to kill somebody. So we're going to do a little swing down through Palm Beach and Boca Grand and Hope Sound when this is all over. And just I'm just going to lie there and, you know, burn it all off. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I feel like Mr. Pasty Boy. It's like we have we've had more fog here in the last month. It's like it's literally like London and I'm ready for a burnout. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Me too. Well, uh, let's see. Latin, you know, actually, I said the last time we spoke was August. That's true. But then we had a communication about Miami. But a- along that way, you sent me some, uh, I think it was a lookbook that your, we're going to jump off here for a second. Your YA adventure series, Time Pirate, Nick of the Time, is being developed into something. Can we talk about that? That's right. That's right. It's, it's a two. Um, the first book uh, in that series was called Nick of Time, uh, made it to the Times Children's List, and then the sequel was called The Time Pirate, and that's the one that Hollywood is interested in right now. And so we made this lookbook, which I actually spent a lot of time working on, them look, going through um, Courier and Ives or whatever, looking for pictures of pirates and pirate ships and all this sort of stuff. But I was really thrilled with the way it came out. Oh, it's gorgeous. It just, if I'm a producer in Hollywood and somebody sends me that, it's I don't have to even have a conversation with them to know what's it about, what's it supposed to look like, who are the characters, what's the period, what's the wardrobe. It's just a great tool, the lookbook. And I'm sure I'm not the first to, to discover it, but I'm working with some people who who think it's a big deal. And so that's where we are. So did you get a chance to take a look at it? I did, and it's brilliant. Can I share? Absolutely. It is, uh, I can use this word, it's delicious. I mean, when you look at it, it's so rich and deep. And like you said, you you can't help but know exactly what's going on, Mm -hmm. which a lot of times a lookbook will be more like a, uh, what do they call it in design, Uh, you know, a a color palette or something, you know, kind of real soft. But this is like, you get it instantly. Yeah, yeah. I I think it's a great, great tool. And speaking of, I do have a question of curiosity. So I'm going to, I mean, 
we're gonna we're gonna get real deep on here in a second. Deep but diving. Deep diving. Ted, this is one of my favorite covers of all of all of your books. Thank you. And it you is. Know what? I will echo that sentiment. I want to send my congratulations to the team at Berkeley Random House Penguin who put that thing together. I think it's a knockout cover, and I it's my favorite one. Yeah. It is. It is without a doubt the best, and I've looked at all of them. But oh, okay. So I do have a question uh, of curiosity. Were you by chance working on any of your YA work simultaneously while you were working on Seahawk? No, no. I started I started the YA series when I moved to London with my daughter in the fourth grade, and 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 a magical house and and and. and Kensington and I called it the Peter Paul and, and Wendy house because it looked just like the Darlings house and I just said this is the time for me to write a children's book and so I wrote I wanted to do um, I felt like nobody was doing Treasure Island nobody was doing Black Beauty nobody was doing any of these old things that, that I had grown up with especially my daughter uh, who was just reading all these R.L. Stein horror books so I said okay I'm going to I'll give them something that's a little bit more the kind of thing that I grew up with, which I thought actually brought me deeper and deeper into the world of reading than a formulaic cartoon book. Right. And speaking of R.L. Stein, I got to meet him at the 2019 uh, Thriller Fest, and he's uh-huh. such a character because he writes such <laughs> wicked stuff, and he's this mild-mannered, just quiet, easygoing guy. All the way to the way, right? <laughs> Um, the reason I ask that, Ted, if I can be perfectly honest, there is an adventure feel. I, I, you know, I make notes when I read these books, and uh, I wrote this book, or this phrase down, adventure feel, along the lines of YA that permeates the book. Yes, it is pure thriller, as your books are, but it has a... So you're talking about Seahawk now. Seahawk, yeah. I'm back right. to Seahawk. So, But it has a youth about it, and, and it, perhaps it's because you bring uh, Alexi into it, but it's the um it feels slightly different than the last couple of books and uh that's why i asked that and it and what i liked about it was that fact right um the answer to your question yeah i think it's because i was so into to that lookbook and pirates and you know and and a 14 year old kid flying a, a uh, a spad against Messerschmitts over, you know, the channel. I, I just was had this whole, I was in adventure mode. You know, I saw this, this trip on this huge yacht as being a epic adventure from the get go. And so I just was just pulling out all the adventure stops, you know, but I, that's a good question and, and, and insightful because yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I, they were just kind of flowing together there a little bit. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But. I think it's a fantastic thing. There was an ebb and a flow. Like when uh, uh, Alex's son appeared, it, it it floated more that way. Maybe yeah. that's because I was seeing it through the father's eyes. So there was that sense of adventure. Um, but yeah, it was very really, uh, warm and heartfelt and yet adventuresome. And it would could almost be YA if it weren't for the fact for some of your language. Well, well are we just, you know, some of these... You know, people write me letters and say, did you really have to use that language? And and I would say something like, I, well, I could at that point have said something like, and that was the night Susie got a hickey at the drive-in. <laughs> I, could have said that. I could have said that, but <laughs> I think I think I might have lost you by the phrase I used, but I would have lost a boatload of people if I said Susie got a hickey at the drive. <laughs> so I'm just saying. Oh my god. Just trying to lay that out there. That is so freaking funny. Um yeah, and let's go back to that boat. Did and excuse my ignorance, Ted, because I didn't research deeply enough but the boat the yacht rather the yeah. super yacht that you created is there anything in the world quite like that yes um there yeah there is it's a boat it's modeled seahawk is modeled on the black pearl 
which from time to time has been the largest sailing yacht in the world and has been most innovative and advanced. So, but it's but it's not it's not just based on the Black Pearl. It's an amalgam of things about other massive o- ocean going play toys um, that that I've looked at. But yeah, there is yeah the, the Black Pearl is pretty close because the sails are carbon fiber. And they're not cloth. They're they're hard, and they rotate with they they swing you know in or out. If you're heeling over, you're 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 going to port or you're going to starboard. It's all controlled uh, from the bridge, not halliers and guys out there you know running up to the top of the masthead and doing all that sorts of. It's very uh, technological. So there's no tearing, no breaking. No, I I kind of I kind of didn't go there with the carbon sails because I wanted to feel more old fashioned. Yeah. So when they're going up the Amazon, they're carrying sail. They're not flying with carbon. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> I love all the Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do it. You know, just somebody somebody said something to me about it. I said, so are you getting a little bit too Bondy now, Ted, with the uh, Elon Musk's green death ray machine. I said, I don't know. You tell me. Am I getting too Bondy? Is Bondy getting too hawky? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of Bond, uh, 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 like side note, anybody that gives you a compliment, which is yet again on this cover, Alex Hawk is the new James Bond by some little, well, un, I think he's an up and coming writer, James Patterson. I've heard, you know, I've heard of this guy. Yeah. I've heard good things about him. Yeah. I think he's doing pretty well for yeah. a guy trying to crack the code. I'm, you know, I'm pretty darn pleased with that, uh, with that, that quote. I mean, I, I really liked it. And so my point is, bring it on. I mean, if anybody compares you to Alex Bond, and we and we talked about this, uh, James Bond. We talked about that reference last time, and it makes me think especially for guys like me who love James Bond, there's no higher compliment ever. And if you, if I had to bring out outside of the fact of copyrights, Goldfinger and Octopussy and fill in the blank of all your bad guys, if I had to take liberties with some of that and bring them in, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Right, right, right. Speaking of which. I had one guy that said for, for 500 bucks, he would give me a blurb as Ted Bella's the new Jackie Collins. And I said, ah, Jackie Collins. I, I don't want to go there. <laughs> First of all, yeah, I'm scratching my head. Second of all, five hundred bucks. <laughs> what? Five hundred bucks? How about fifty grand? Maybe I'll think about it. <laughs> oh, um, Lord. Speaking of uh, James Bond, uh, we we went to see No Time to Kill. Yeah. Have, have you seen it yet? Yeah, I did. I did. <sighs> yeah, I liked it. Oh. Yeah, I was glad to see it. Glad to see it back. Oh, and so my wife and I came home. Tammy and I came home within the next couple of days and started going back to the beginning of Daniel Craig's, and we just would do one a night. And we came away with some new realizations that we had never quite threaded them all together. So, it, right. so this movie is the perfect culmination of Daniel Craig. So when you go to the theater with Tim, where do you guys go to the pictures? Where, what part of the country are you going to the pictures at? San Diego and at a uh, Sinopolis. Okay. Have you been to a Sinopolis? No, I haven't. So it's some big multi-screen. Theodore, let me educate you on something quite extraordinary. You do by all means, David, please. <laughs> first of all, uh, first of all, you get there. It's not a humongous room which is great you have these fantastic side-by-side electronic barca loungers and then you have a little key code that whenever you're watching anything you just go boop and they show up at the row below you and say what may i give what may i take as your order and i'd like i'd like a martini a bucket of popcorn and twizzlers for my wife wow and they scoot away in darkness and within moments it shows up right in my tray oh fantastic that's fantastic. As they say, worth the price of admission, Ted. We don't have one of those in Charles, and I'm afraid to say. <laughs> well, by God, maybe when we head on down to Miami way. 
Oh, we'll see one down loud. Got to be. It, seriously, it is, it's a little more pricey, but who cares? It's the experience. The first one I saw, and I can't remember how many years ago, but I was, it was in, it was in Vail. And this girl I was going out with said, I got to take you to this movie theater. We can eat. We can get, we can get a beer. We can have, and I said, come on, give me a break. This is like six or seven years ago. And I, I think it folded. I don't think it, it didn't succeed for whatever reason. But your thing sounds much more high tech. It is amazing. And everything has become completely touchless because of COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you enter, you go to a screen, tick, 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 tick. There's no, there's no paper tickets. You just swipe your phone. Wow. Pay in advance if you want to pay on your phone. Go there, just scan it, walk in, sit down. It's, um, I should be getting a kickback to do this plug. What do you think? I think so. I do yeah. too. I'm trying to look for an angle where I can get in on it, get in on the plug so I can, you know. How did you feel when, when I guess I don't think we're going to see Mr. the likes of Mr. Craig again. I yeah, that's very delicately put. I think he's made other choices. Yeah, he has, I think. Um, how did I feel about that? I'll be perfectly honest. It kind of crushed me because I'm a big Daniel Craig fan. I think he did a great job. He, you know, I, Sean Connery was always my favorite. No question. He, Nobody close. he was Bond. He was. So, so I had a hard time ever really seeing any, and all the guys who came after, I'm like, all right, I'm in for the ride. Yeah. And a couple of them, you know, they, they always say that the guy that, that everybody makes fun of was the best guy. George Lazenby, was that his name? Yeah, George Lazenby, the Australian guy. I never saw his movie. Mm, but, um, uh, I don't know. You know, I don't. And then I, I Roger Moore never was my favorite uh, because I, I felt he had sort of a French maitre d' quality that I just it, it wasn't working for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great analogy. And no, I what, love the guy. I think he's. I think he's a fabulous guy, and I think he's a great actor. But it just I couldn't get past that kind of suave. Table for two, table for two. <laughs> you know, that's, that's probably a horrible thing to say, but anyway, I think he did. In some of those movies, he was great. Let me just say that. He was. Yeah. And here's a gentleman, while we're still on the topic, here's a gentleman that I really, really like. I admire. I, I admire most for his de decisions in movies that he chooses to make. And I've heard a lot about his reputation, which is pretty darn near impeccable. And, and I hear he's just a remarkably kind guy, and that is Pierce Brosnan. Absolutely. 100%. However. I think, I think he did a great job. He did do a great job, but the, the one thing I, I I was joking with Tammy about it that day, I said the thing about with Pierce Brosnan, and I loved him, and I love his sense of humor, yeah. but it's the you know I don't care what fight he's in, I don't care what is happening, his hair is never out of place. <laughs> That's right, you got perfect hair. It's so funny. Yesterday, I don't know where I was reading this about how difficult his life was. Oh yeah. And which I had no knowledge. I figured he was to the manor born and grew up and went to Eton and went to Cambridge. And no, he had a tough, tough go, I think. Yeah. Tough go. And his, he and his wife have been married. I could pull this up and impress you, but he, they've been married for, I want to say 50 years. That's great. And uh, anybody who can pull that off is just, I'm a big fan of. But yeah, back to Daniel Craig. Yeah. So, and that love story in there that got carried over, which, uh, tell me when that ever happened in the entire series. It, it, it may be there. I, I don't remember it. Tell me, tell me, I'm a little lost here. Remember how he had a love story inside of uh, the one right before it? In front of the movie right before? Uh, uh, no Time to Die? Yeah, but I can't remember it. Yeah, and um, Spectre, that love story that carried into the finale right. was just so remarkable, uh, which makes the ending so poignant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was her, what was her name, her character name in the, in, in the prior movie? Okay, now I'm going to really have to do it. No time to die. She plays Madeline, and her yeah. name is Leia Seydoux, S-E-Y-D-O-U-X. Yeah. yeah, I do remember that she was incredibly beautiful. But it didn't, it, the story didn't remain with me. Mm, well, since that book came out, yes, since that movie came out. 
nonetheless it does oh let's let's keep on this for one more beat because we're both yeah. such bond fans who do you think is or should be next for me yes who would you choose and there's yeah, you've I'm, heard I'm, I'm i'm choosing the next hawk which um that's my job and uh so I'll tell you who my front runner is, and I'm not sure I'm gonna it's gonna happen, but boy, would I love to see it happen. Um, is Tom Hardy. Oh my god, now, yes. You know, and then I think Chris Hensworth would be great too for a thousand different reasons than, than Tom Hardy. But both of them, I think, yeah, it'd be a tough call for me. Tom Hardy is one of those guys, and this is, might be a wee bit of a cliche, but I don't care. He does such an exceptional job of disappearing into each character, making each one, right? Yeah, he does. He does. It's a great way of putting it, actually. You just, you just throw it away. That's, and I think that's the magic of a, a true craftsman. The, well, the time he went away, the first time I saw him go away, and the time that I realized, okay, this is... This will will be until somebody changes my. This is my idea of Alex Hawk is this guy right here, and that was Legend, which was he and his brother were sort of playing the Cray brothers as criminals in sixties London, and and Tom played there's this the suave, good looking guy who's breaking the hearts of all of them, and there's this sort of homicidal maniac brother who carries a like a, a giant curved blade knife and i never knew until walking out of the theater with this other couple and this friend of mine and this guy says that hardy's great isn't he i said yeah he's just phenomenal i mean you know he said well which which character did you like him better as i said excuse me <laughs> he said which one did you like him better as the, the handsome boulevard jay guy or the crazy psycho guy i said what do you mean he said, he played both parts. I said, get out. I didn't believe it. I didn't wow. believe it. And then I went back and looked at it. I said, yep, he did. He did. Ronald and Reginald Cray. That is one of my That's favorites. And, and I'm with you. I saw that movie and I'm like, holy balls. What? He's, right. he's both guys? Because they're so, you know, a lot of guys will do that double play. And you're like, oh, they've just flipped the camera around. You know, it's kind of a mirror. But no, these are two so specific Oh my God, he's so good. Fantastic, yeah. Man, I hope you... That'd be great, wouldn't it? It would be so good. But I'm always on the lookout, you know? Everything I go see, I'm looking for the next the next hawk. You know, and not only does he disappear, and part of the reason, you, you some would call it a gimmick. You know, you can put on a beard, you can put on long hair, and oh, you're different. But there's something about his metamorphosis that he, yes, he can shave his head and do a beard, but it's the way he transforms his face, kind of like Christian oh, yeah. Bale. Christian yeah. Bale. Oh, absolutely. He does oh. that too. I hope when when do you got any leads on that? That's just a that's a dream. That's a wish a wish list, or is that? Well, is there... I mean, it, 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 it Hollywood is just it's it's so chimerical. I mean, I, I now have producers that that I'm absolutely crazy about, and have been known, and they're the they're the going way back to when the first Hawkbook made the list. Um, these producers who shall go nameless for obvious reasons, brought me Tom Cruise to be hot. And um, and I, I it had never occurred to me to Tom Cruise. Anyway, I they said, you know, we'll fly out there and you can meet with Tom and his sister and his people and his uh, Paula Wagner, his business partner and all this stuff. And I did all this and did all this. But I just never felt right about it and I just so it didn't happen and so I think there were a lot of people that you know maybe had some hurt feelings or they were disappointed and um you know what are you gonna do you know how amazing that is Ted I mean uh not to be starstruck but to have Tom Cruise interested and you have the opportunity and go nah God, God doesn't feel right mm. well, it was it was it was it was well it was really interesting because I'm my opinion of Tom has has gone like that. I mean, in these last couple of movies, and now he's he's shooting these World War II 
fighter planes that he's actually shooting the he's in the cockpit i mean i think I, i'm a lot bigger fan of tom cruise's right now than i was that day sitting in the miami airport getting ready to go out there and talk to him about hawk um but but that's okay um and a, one one backstory that was kind of cool they uh, they said uh Ted would, you know, Tom, Tom was really not all that big a reader. He's not that crazy about reading. Would you be, be willing to um, drive up to Telluride to the ranch and read him the book over the weekend? And I said, no, uh, no, I would do that. You know, that's what I was like going along with it. Maybe this is meant to be. <laughs> so I'm, I'm leaving Aspen and it's like it's sunny. And then I'm halfway to Telluride and it's white out. And I had to turn around and go back. So I never did get to the ranch to talk to him or to, to, to help to make friends with him or read the book with him or whatever I wanted to do. So nothing ever, nothing ever came. And then right on the heels of that, literally within weeks, Johnny Depp. Weeks. Weeks after Tom. Whoa. Yeah. And they were pushing. Warner Brothers was really... A guy named Kevin McCormick was running Warner Brothers. He he was sort of Johnny's guy. And he just said, you got to get Johnny for this part. You got to do it. You got to do it. And um, anyway. Dude, I don't think I could be any more jealous of you right now if I possibly well, tried. If you knew <laughs> the flip side of everything I'm telling you right now, you might not feel that way. I think it's because uh, I've always been like a, a closet filmmaker, you know, a couple of shorts, one commercial film to my credit. And uh, every book I read, especially your books, this this is such a freaking movie. If if this isn't a movie, then I'm a, I'm a friggin' idiot. So I see books as movies and I just build them uh, right away. And uh, my dream one day is to direct a, can another. Can I stick a pin in that? What you yes, just please. Said, to talk off the air. Mm hmm about exactly what you're talking about and about something that I'm excited about, which is exactly what you're talking about. So I, and, and I'm not going to tell anybody about it, but you. Oh, I'm uh, so honored. So it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be pretty phenomenal actually. Okay. I'm putting it, a pen. It's a book, but it's, it's just got huge potential. Well, I'm very excited about that. And we'll, I, I can't wait to get through the show now, but I'm going to yet press on. Yes. Um, we've talked about Daniel Craig and James Bond, but I do want to go back to, um, I have a couple of bullet points. I think I've already mentioned it. This book, hell of a ride, hell of a ride. Second, I have a ginormous appreciation for the development, all your highly expensive man toys. I mean, that's another piece of magic mm -hmm. that reflects James Bond. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I, I sort of felt like I had license to do the, the, the Elon Musk you know, death ray. Mm -hmm. uh, if my great idol, Mr. Fleming, can do a book called Moonraker, right, which is about a, a, a missile designed to take out London mm -hmm. uh, back in the 50s, I think I'm, I was on pretty solid ground there with, with a death ray from Elon. In fact, the fact is... I know the Chinese are working on working on doing these these laser weapons. So, where's the problem? You know, when you when I got to those parts, especially yeah, when China arose, uh, and I've been doing a lot of behind the scenes research for a project I'm working on, and yeah, I mean China is going to whoop up and surprise us, and if we don't think that's going to happen, we're asleep we at the wheel. Think it's going to happen. I hope it never happens. I hope that we that our two economies are so entwined that it would be a disaster, for, a simultaneous disaster for both of us that we would never be able to recover from. And he knows it. And well, I don't know about our guy. I don't know if our guy knows it, but I know there knows it <laughs> that it would not be a good thing. <laughs> I'm going to leave that one alone, but I will say uh, you make a really good point. Since they do, it's it's like they lean against each other, and yeah. it, it's a it's a bilateral support. You pull away one, and, and they both fall. Uh, right, exactly. However, there are some psychopaths in and around the arena 
yeah. let's see if I can be as politically safe as I can. That would not surprise me if they pulled an ego move. But yeah, to your point, uh, we're too important for them. Oh, oh, you mean in real life? In real life. Oh, not, not, not fiction, but real life. Yeah, I, that's scary. Uh, especially, is it North Korea who's building these missiles that are very... Uh, uh, infinitely more advanced than in the past and with the further ranges and etc i wish i could tell you that it was just them but it's not it's uh it's china and it's the iranians and the north koreans and we are really late to the game and these things are game changers and and, and they play a very important role in the book that i'm writing right now very important role is this the book that we're not mentioning, but we're going to talk about off air? Sort of, sort of, but it, it could be, it could be, it could go either way. I, I, well, I'll tell you about it. Okay. So, uh, again, back to these toys, because I'm just, a, that's probably one of my favorite things of all time. The AI systems, the helicopters, the yeah, planes, yeah. the luxury cars, the super yacht. Um, I mean, it's a wet dream for guys who love all those uber priced toys. Right. right. Um, I, I, you can never give me enough of that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, you're going to like the next one. Okay. Um, it's fun. My third point, I love the introduction. I've seen it spelled two different ways, both in your press release and then inside the book. So I'm a little bit confused by, I am pronouncing it correctly, Alexi, correct? Yeah, Alexi. Okay. Yeah, A-L-E-X-E-I. Is oh, E-I, is okay. Pronunciation. I mean, the Russian pronunciation of his... Uh, that's his nickname. You know, his father was nicknamed too when he was a little boy. Right. But it's definitely Alexei. Yeah. Okay. Copy that. And also some of the, he, by the way, he's just, he's just precious. And I know, I have to believe he's going to grow up and carry on the tradition. Yes. There you go. There you go. Alex Hawk Jr. Yeah. Has to be. <laughs> Yeah. And that's a that's that's one of the beautiful things, and where I tip my hat to you, Ted. Not that you need it, but you you've created this legacy, and you probably planned this out early on. But I mean, what, what do we got? Nineteen New York Times bestsellers? Uh, uh, sixteen. I think it's sixteen. I there's four. I, I'm sure on, on four, fourteen counting. Uh, the last one, and then and then the two children's. Uh, YA books were, were on the list. So that's 14 plus. I, it's like 16 or uh, who knows. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you more credit. There you go. Okay. But take let's talk about these. Uh, there's three guys that I really kind of zoned in on. First was MI6 Chief uh, David Truelove. And these are, these are three characters that I would uh, su suggest that have not so hidden agendas. Him being the first one. Tell me about him for listeners who uh, haven't seen this character yet. Sir David Trulove. Yeah, David Trulove is based on um, a, a real person that I know and um, uh, actually became a friend of mine because he became a fan of the books. And he came to New York uh, for, a, for a book signing at Barnes & Noble on 86th Street on a rainy night with another friend of mine who became extraordinarily famous in the Russiagate process and then talking about disappearing. And then um, who was a life fellow at Maudlin College at Cambridge, brought this guy to the signing, had, said, come on over here, I want you to meet somebody. I go over to meet the guy. I said, this is Richard, he's from England, he's him. he loves your books and da. Uh, and so I, you know, thought that you wouldn't mind if I brought him. I said, no, it's great. So I hope he enjoys the thing. So I do my little talk and um, I'm trying to, I made a joke about having fights with the publisher about titles and um, then we had this huge fight and they wanted to call it, you know, Bridge Too Far. And I wanted to call it Cheap Sex. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just totally made that up, but I mean, he he laughed. I mean, he thought it was funny. Yeah. So then, so then I went over to them and he said, "Richard would like to know if you would, two of us are going to go down the street to Swifties to have dinner. Would you like to join us?" I said, "Absolutely." Have I told you this story before? No. So Swifty Lazars. Yeah, Swifty Swifty. Well, 
Yeah, yeah, but not the not the not the producer Swifty. It was the restaurant tour on the Upper East Side of New York. Got it. Named Swifty, and he had a very famous restaurant for a while, and that's where we went. And so the whole dinner, this guy's name is Richard, and he's saying, Ted, when you say that Putin basically told that that uh, basically told that Russian guy to go stuff. I mean, did you? How, would he, would Putin really do that? I said, yeah, he would. He actually would. And he said, how do you know that? I said, well, A, I make it up. B, I do a hell of a lot of research. I read all of the biographies about him. I read all his speeches. I watch all his film. And I just put myself into his, into him. And that's when I'm sitting there, it's not like I'm thinking, oh, what would Putin do? I'm like, I'm just doing, you know, because I'm just in my potent Putin mode. <laughs> And so, but it went on and on and on and on and on. And where did you get this idea with, if China, because I was, the, the, the punchline of the story is that Richard, Sir Richard Dearlove, head of MI6, C, got me elected to Cambridge as a visiting scholar that night. And he and I became like that. And I, I mean, I, it was just one of the great rides of my whole life. And, uh, and he said, and so what's this thing? China's going to close the South Seas, the South Seas, and to everybody, um, out, everybody who's not Chinese, no other countries are able to transit, transit. And I said, well, what if we had, like, Hawk has this idea that we get the biggest freighter and military vessels from every single nation, and we put them in formation in single line, and we just sail right up the throat of that goddamn entrance and right through the South Sea, through, through, the, through the goddamn South China Sea, and let's see what they do about it. He said, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I like it too. And that's what he said to Stefan, the other guy, would it be fun to have Ted at Cambridge? He said, yeah. He said, he doesn't think of the way we do. He just doesn't even begin to think. We're thinking like based on thousands of years of learning tradecraft from the Ionians or whatever the hell it is. But so anyway, I got I got invited and I went. Oh wow, what a great story. It was a great year. It was a great year, yeah. So Sir David True Love is based, based on upon Richard True Love. Okay, got it. Totally. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now here's a guy at the other end of the spectrum, and I'm, am, am I pronouncing it correctly? Fideo Chico. Fideo Chico. Yeah. yeah, which means little little sausage or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a flattering name. I love that. And then, of course, Mr. Smith. Yeah, who, as we all know, sooner or later, his day will come. Yep. It often happens, Ted. I'm sorry to tell you, but um, yeah. Yeah, I kind of hated to do it, but I think I milked him for like, how many more times am I going to have him? Yeah. So we need a new bad guy now. Yeah. Well, I, that's, isn't that one of your favorite things to create? It's one of mine. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Just the best. Yeah. I just love, well, the minute I heard that name from a friend of mine and they told me that there was actually a guy living on the Mississippi river working around the plantations. And that was his name. S Smith. Yeah. And I said, you've got it. He said, Nope. He's a friend of my mom's. <laughs> and she called him S. S. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was fun to have milk that for a while. Well, Ted, as you know, we're going to be releasing this show on Friday, which is okay. the third, and only four days later, Seahawk is going to drop. That's right. Uh, and, and here's a question, uh, and I know you'll tell me honestly because that's the kind of friendship we have. Are you as excited each time around? I mean, with 16 New York Times bestsellers, I wonder if it ever gets even the tiniest bit passe. No. No, I, I, it just it feels silly now that I think about it. No, but. no, it's, it's just great. Yeah. I mean, it, it, nothing can ever rival the first time. That was just one of the great moments of my entire life. It just reduced me to tears. And that's not going to happen again. But 
you know, it's just kind of nice to keep, you know, striving for that anyway. And I was listening. Who was I speak? Uh, Meg Gardner early on yeah. in the broadcast. Yeah. She said we were talking about being a New York Times bestseller, and she said it is one of the single most difficult. Yes, prestigious, but infinitely more difficult than one would think to be on that list. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it it feels daunting. I mean, it's always been kind of a dream of mine. I don't know if it's a silly dream to have, but I, I've always, as my dad used to say, say, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Yeah, that's a good line. So I grew up thinking that way, and I and he was one of these guys that, who said, uh, I mean, big fan of mine. He's passed, and he said, look, Aim, aim at whatever you want. If you're going to put your focus somewhere anyway, then just go at it like it's the last thing on earth you do. And I've always kind of done that. Yeah, right, right, right. The Pulitzer Prize for, uh, I mean, sorry, the Nobel Prize for Literature is always sitting out there waiting for you if you want to like, I mean, if you want to one-up, you know, the, <laughs> the rest of the boys. Well, yeah, maybe. I don't know, I I'm, guess. I'm just kidding. I, but I, that's... Um, I don't know how, how much time we got left, but my former agent, who's now a very dear friend of mine, uh, is a, a wonderful chap named Peter Lampack. And Peter was Clive Cussler's uh, agent for his entire career. He, Peter started his, his uh, firm with Clive. And, uh, and he had uh, uh, Martha Grimes, who wrote those wonderful mysteries the, the, from the British kind of uh, ladies, cozy mysteries. And then he had John Coetzee, who wrote um, Savage, and he wrote, he was a South African writer. And so Peter gets a call one day, this is going back a few years, and he said, are you Mr. Lampe? He said, yes, you represent Mr. Coetzee in, in South Africa. He says, yes, I do. What can I do for you? He said, he says he's, he's not interested in the Nobel Prize for Literature. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> now that's, that's chutzpah, you know? So, wow. it, so it turned out that Peter and his wife, Diane, were going to have to go and, and Peter was going to have to either write or get the speech and give the speech as if Kotsi was there. Uh -huh. And, uh, and so he had written a speech while he was working at Princeton uh, about a subject that would have worked for the acceptance speech for the prize. But then the Princeton people called Peter and said, you can't use that. He wrote it under our auspices and we own the rights to it. <laughs> anyway, he, guess what? He finally went, he got on the plane mm -hmm. and, and I was there the next summer and they've got the, all the recordings of all the, 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 the winners you know, going back to Hemingway and Faulkner and everything. And and so I went in and walked around and listened to everybody. And I said, where's Coatsy's speech? And he said, oh, he's over in the corner. I said, I, I got to hear what this guy said. And I said, "Was just tell me before, was he good? He said, he was the best, funniest guy we have ever had. I said, holy smoke. So he blew him away. Whatever he did. He I blew love him away. it. Great story. I love that. Well, Ted, before we get to our uh, rapid fire questions that kind of wraps the show, I do want to ask, here's an interesting thing. I just noticed this, Ted, forgive me for not noticing this earlier. You're on a virtual bookstore tour for Seahawk with uh, Buxton Books down in Charleston there on Monday. Yeah, that's correct. Polly Buxton. You're uh, in conversation with Ryan Steck of um, yes. Real Book Spy. That's correct. But guess what? You're with uh, my new friend, Luke McCallan on Thursday the 9th. Yeah, yeah. Reason I say new friend is he is on next Friday's show. Wow, fantastic. One big happy family. He, he I, I, sorry to say, never heard of him. Yeah. But his book, uh, From the Dark Horizon, uh, is amazing. He's such an affable gentleman. Uh, we yeah. talked out. He's in France. Uh, yeah, he's he's. You're gonna have a you're gonna have a good time. Have you guys spoken before? No, I have not spoken to. I've spoken to Ryan a lot. Yeah, yeah. Ryan's a Ryan's a big fan of all those guys and uh, big fan of, of everybody's. Yeah, and they're all big fans of his. 
Yeah. All right, time for our rapid fart questions. Really super. Can I, do I have time to take a Valium before? The... Super simple, Ted. I'm making it easy on you. It's like we're just sitting, sitting around having a couple of cocktails in the backyard. In the backyard. Yeah. While writing. Do you, and if I've asked you these before, just bear okay. with me and keep moving. It doesn't matter. I'll answer them again. While writing, do you prefer coffee, tea, or a dry martini? I would prefer the, the dry martini. I'm not sure how much writing I'd get done. <laughs> I think I would have to say I prefer to, prefer to start with the coffee. Yeah. And maybe end with the martini. Perfect. That would be my, my perfect writing day. Exceptional. And while writing, do you, I don't recall this one, do you prefer music or silence? Silence. I try music sometimes when I'm feeling, you know, I used to play the uh, Apocalypse Now thing when I was trying to get myself all drummed up about blowing shit up and, you know, being in adventures. And, and I'd play that storm and drawing music. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, I haven't done that so much anymore. Yeah. When you and Victoria are on vacation, what's your favorite, but perhaps least personal, wink, wink, thing that you two enjoy doing? Oh, God. Well, I think we just, you know, we're so much birds of a, of a feather. Yeah. That we just kind of gravitate towards the, the same things. I mean, what we gravitate to is what we miss, you know, like... Like we were talking earlier, I just want a beach. I want to be on a boat. You know, I want my fingers dragging through the surf behind the, you know, or something. Uh, what was that old song? Got my son on my shoulders, got my toes in the sand. Woman left me for another man. I don't care. I just smile and keep trying. That's <laughs> that's my song. That's my my anthem. I want to go back to Jamaica where I used to go, and just sit somewhere and hear somebody sing that song. That's yeah. Me. Still speaking of you two, if you were both stranded on an island, let's just say uh, a recent hurricane came through and you can pick the island of your choice. What are the two or three? Doesn't have to be complicated. Two or three things that you're really happy that you remember to bring with you because you don't know how long you're going to be there before help comes. Right. Really want to know? Yeah. Okay. My desalinization kit. My, uh, my fishing lures. Uh... My rigor. How many things am I allowed? I was going to say two or three, but you got desalinization, fishing yeah, lures. What's the third thing? Uh, a fishing rod. Okay, oh, sure. That'd be it. And That's maybe it. A book, some books. I don't know. Okay. Good. Perfect. You and Victoria are going to join Tammy and I for yep. real this time for dinner. Yep. Great. But you're going to join us for a lively dinner at our home here outside San Diego. You'd love it. Nothing more. It's so spectacular. I thought it was in L.A., and I've got every reason to fly out there from a, from a business point of view, too. Now, so you're going to join us for this dinner, uh, and we'd love for you to invite two more people to round it out to a nice six. I think six is a nice gathering. Who of the two, living or dead, men or women, who would you jo ask to join us? Wow. Now, I know that we would be company enough, Ted, I feel. but well, I think you would, too. But all the off chance that we needed, you know, a little more, mix it up for a little more livelier conversation. Man or woman, dead or alive. Wow, mm. that's tough. Dude. Um, Tom Wolf mm. <laughs> would be like one of my, and, 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 and somebody I know and have had a number of dinners with and just love, love being with him. How many more do I get? Just one. Oh, I only get one? You get two, but you get one more. So Tom Wolf is one. That's my perfect choice. And my second one would be Mark Twain. <laughs> Exceptional. <laughs> Exceptional. Oh, you didn't let me down. Are you going to have a martini now? Because I think I am. Well, I do have one more question. I would. Well, it is almost lunchtime. Maybe I'll slide. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll slide one in with lunch. It would it would help me feel better. I'm so parched, Ted. I'm God, uh, it's so uh, hot. You get parched. You get parched. 
Yeah, it just it's such a refreshing beverage too. <laughs> All right, as we close, I would like this, and you've given us. Uh, I got paid the highest compliment from Luke McCallum the other day as we wrapped the show. It meant so much to me, and it, he's the first guy that said, "You know, thank you for this show. Thank you for everything you've introduced me to." Because he's out there buying books of writers that I've introduced that he's never heard about. Yeah. And I just wanted to say to you, uh, I'm a I'm a big fan. You know that, and. I'd love to hear your advice for writers, like f something you've maybe something you've lived by, something you think as an aspiring writer trying to make that New York Times bestseller list. What would you say, you know, do this or, you know, understand this? Don't ever emulate anybody. Anybody. I mean, not Scott Fitzgerald, not, you know, uh, to kill a mock, just don't emulate anybody, and then don't um, and don't give up. Perfect. That's it. That's that's it. Is it hard? Yeah, it's really hard, but it's really rewarding. And it's really fun when it when it starts. When you start to, some guy just finished his first book and he made it on the, the list, and he sent me a note. And I sent him a book, and I wrote back and said, "Congrat." I can't tell you his name right now, but I said, "Congratulations, you've passed." phase one now you start the fun part which is you made the list and now you just write your books pal just write them that is such a good piece of advice yeah it's fun to hear him he reacted to that yeah and you know i know it's daunting and i know that he, I, I spoke to someone recently about their fear of they did it once but they were afraid that they can never do it again and i'm like i i guess i understand that yeah especially if you've spent years and years on the first one. Yeah. But if you've spent any time crafting multiple books that just even set aside, you already know how to do it. You just, it's, right. it's the right story at the right time, picked up by the right person released to the right audience. Right. right. Yeah. It just reminds me of, of a, and cause I think you know that, that Jim, the Patterson, and I became friends in advertising and we lived in, played golf in Florida together and live right around the corner from each other. Yep. And so right after Hawk came out, uh, and we used to go to the to the uh, Trump golf course on every Monday morning, and so we're driving down the fairway. And he said, "I said, so well that was fun, you know. Thanks for all your help and uh, luck." That I said, "Yeah, now comes the really hard part." And I said, "All oh, right, I thought I just did the hard part. No, no. Now you got to write your sophomore book, and that's the one that can make or break you." And that put the fear of God in me, I have to tell you. Wow. Well, I, agree, I agree with him. I said, he's right. You can't come back in like three swings and a miss. I mean, you, you better be something. I thought that was a good thing for him to say to me. Because it probably helped me get over that hump, actually. Yeah. It does take a tremendous amount of believing in yourself, doesn't it? And, and, and going back to the topic of don't you know try to uh, mimic someone is that i've always had this perhaps somewhat innocent theory that if if you want it badly enough and you've you know the desire has been woven into your character yeah and you work hard to perfect it every day and you truly you're doing it for the right reasons you have something to say you want to you know i'm not talking about providing a living for your family and becoming rich because you sold millions of books because if you're doing it for that reason, I th think it could be a dead end. But go the wrong way. Yeah, you're chasing the wrong path. But I don't know. I, I just have this belief. It's kind of like when I was, and I don't know if I ever told you the story. I don't know if I've ever shared this on the show. I was nine years old, 10 years old, and I'm sitting on the living room floor watching television. I'll never forget this. My folks are sitting on the couch behind me. And this announcer came on the TV, you know, one of these tonight's movie of the week is, and I thought, and my voice had just started to change. And I said, dad, that's what I want to do. Wow. I want to, I want to be that guy. I want to be that voice. And then it became with time. I'm like, I want to be on the radio and that's, and I don't care what it takes. I'm going to do whatever it takes. And then as I started to ease into it, I'm like, Okay, I'm going to be super specific. Before I am 40, I want to be on at least five of the top 10 radio shows in the country. Uh, and I did. Um, 
I hope you saw this movie because I can't remember the name of it. But all I can remember, there was a line that kept repeating and repeating and repeating. It was in a world. Oh, yeah. And it was about a girl who wanted to be a voiceover. But the whole thing was about the world of voiceover. Have you ever seen that movie? Yes, I have. She had fights with her father. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's been a while. In a world. Yeah. Ted, this has been is You're awesome. Cute. It's always fun. Always. I look forward to it. And I can't right. wait to see you guys in, in San Diego. So if not sooner. Man, uh, yeah, uh, either way, uh, yeah. Miami or San Diego. Um, we've got some family travels coming up. I'm sure yeah. you do. Yeah, yeah. But uh, thanks to Victoria, is she still around? She's uh, she, she's like she's she's bustling around. Well, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what she's doing. She might be working on supper. Just big thanks to her because uh, I will tell her that you said that for sure. I I did miss seeing Cynthia, but uh, I, oh, I somebody just said to tell you thank you so much for all your incredible help. Oh, and I'm not going to tell you who it is to say it either. Oh, so okay, yeah. no, it quite a secret. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to ring off now. But uh, until we speak again, always a thrill, always a thrill. Thanks again, Ted. Always feels good having your energy around. Okay, folks, if you were listening closely, you may already know who's on next Friday's show. Yep. Luke McCallan, author of From a Dark Horizon, is on next week's show. If you're a fan of historical thrillers that read nearly like a documentary, you're going to love our time together because he's a super nice guy and he's got a great book on his hands. Before we go, here's a quick reminder to review our show, either on Apple Podcast or right on our website, thethrillerzone.com. We appreciate any and all input and especially enjoy five-star reviews. Okay, I'm David Temple, and I'll see you next week on The Thriller Zone.